The Bible is a book of adventure and war and love and romance and mystery. It has all kinds of different stories inside. And today's story that we'll take a look at has so many twists and turns that at times you may feel as though you're on a roller coaster that's upside down and going at the speed of light because that's how fast this thing is going to go down. Now we're going to start out in a graveyard and then we're going to soar through the clouds and then we're going to enter a castle. And where we end up is anybody's guess. Because today's story is one of those choose your own endings kind of story. Did you know the Bible has some of those? It does. And you get to choose your own ending. Now the story we'll take a look at is found in Mark chapter 5 verses 1 through 26. The same story can be found in Mark chapter 8 verses 26 to 40. We'll mainly focus on Mark's version of the story, but we'll borrow a few details from Luke and we'll implement that within Mark's version, okay? So let's go ahead and dig in to our final Bible study on being radically renewed. And uh, we'll start again with Mark chapter 5, verse 1. Here we go. When they arrived at the other side of the lake, a demon-possessed man ran out from a graveyard just as Jesus was climbing from the boat. He approached Jesus. As vile and despicable as he was, this tormented man approached Jesus. Do you know what that shows us? We can approach Jesus. He's approachable. Don't ever believe a lie from Satan that says you're too far gone. Oh, you're worthless. You've messed up too many times to approach Jesus. No. Jesus is always approachable. And you can always approach him. Now this man was tormented. He was filled or possessed with many demons. And right off the bat, he could sense something's not right. His hair stood on end. Sudden chills consumed his body. He was tense. He knew something was off. There's something not right. And, and then he could feel it, a, a sudden disturbance in this supernatural demonic force that was in him. And the sudden disturbance was because Jesus was near. You see, the last person a demon wants to see is Jesus Christ. And yet, pulling up in his boat right there in the shore was every demon's worst nightmare, Jesus himself. And this poor, vile, despicable, possessed man literally ran out to the shore to meet him. Let's look at the next verse, verses 3 and 4. This man lived among the gravestones, or in the cemetery. And he had such strength that whenever he was put into handcuffs and shackles, as he often was, he snapped the handcuffs from his wrist and smashed the shackles and walked away. No one was strong enough to control him. You see, because of that satanic power within him, whenever he was bound with ropes, it was like snapping dental, cloth, dental floss. And so society had finally chained him. They put him in shackles, thinking that would help. But he burst through the shackles as well. He was filled with a supernatural demonic power. He still broke free. Let's look at verse 5. All day long and all through the night, he would wander among the tombs. You see, he actually lived in the cemetery. And he would wander in the wild hills, screaming, this tells us he was miserable, and cutting himself with sharp pieces of stones. Did you know that cutting is nothing new? <laughs> cutting is nothing new to Jesus. Cutters are mentioned in the Bible, but this isn't the first cutter. If we would flash back to the Old Testament, you'll remember the prophets of Baal and Elijah as they were engaged in a battle on Mount Carmel. Do you remember that? And Elijah is praying for his God, Jehovah, to burn his bull, and the prophets of Baal are praying to their God, and they're not getting anything from Baal, so Elijah starts to taunt them. And he says, well, maybe he's away. Maybe he's not listening. Maybe your prayers aren't getting through. Maybe you better push up the action a notch. And so Scripture says, as was their custom, they began cutting themselves with knives and with swords until the blood literally began to gush out. So cutting is nothing new to Jesus. He understands the intensity and the pain behind one who cuts. It's not the answer now. It wasn't the answer then. It's never the answer. But Jesus does understand the emotional hurt and turmoil and pain that goes on in a person who feels 
that he or she has to cut. It's not the answer, but Jesus understands it. Now there's more information, like I said earlier, about this guy in Luke's version of the story. We find out from Luke's version that this man is completely destitute. He's homeless. We find out that he's also naked. I mean, he has nothing. Where is he living? He's living in a cemetery. What does that say about him? It says no hope at all. What does that say about his identity? Major identity crisis. It says, I identify with the dead. I belong here with the gravestones in a cemetery with the dead people. This is my identity. He was experiencing extreme loneliness and massive aloneness. Two different things, but both very severe. He's apart from friends. He's away from family. Society wants nothing to do with him. Their answer, chain him up because we don't know what else to do. Chain him up, tie him up, just send him away. He's in a horrible condition. And the devil is slowly destroying this pitiful man's life. Now, we don't know how he became like this, do we? The Bible doesn't tell us those details. It could be as a little boy, he had been abused. And maybe he had never learned to give that pain to God and, and get help with it. And so maybe he let Satan have a foothold in his life. Or maybe as a middle schooler, he was bullied incessantly or he was ostracized. Or maybe there was a death in his family or a divorce. Uh, something traumatic could have happened. And you know that when we don't give our pain and hurt to Jesus, uh, it often has a chance to, to fester and to boil. And pain can turn into depression. And depression and anger go hand in hand. And, and when we don't give that to God, Satan has a chance to approach us or to have a foothold. And when we don't have Jesus to fill up our lives, Satan can easily fill our lives. So we don't know how this man became this way. All we know is he's in a horrible condition and Satan is slowly destroying this poor guy's life. Let's look at the next verse, chapter uh, verse 6. When Jesus was still far out on the water, the man had seen him and had run to meet him and fell down before him. This is Pretty much a repeat of the first verse, isn't it? Only we see it from a little bit different perspective now. In the first verse, Jesus had pulled right up to shore. In this verse, verse 6, he's still out on the water a little ways. And scripture says the man had seen him still out on the water, and he ran and fell face downward on the ground before Jesus. Again, it's a repeat of the fact that we can approach Jesus. He's approachable. He's relational. He loves people. He's crazy about you. Again. Don't ever believe that you're too far gone to get right with God. Jesus is approachable. This guy fell, and he fell flat on his face. Let's look at the next two verses, 7 and 8. Then Jesus spoke to the demon within the man and said, Come out, you evil spirit. It gave a terrible scream, shrieking, What are you going to do to me, Jesus? Son of the Most High God, for God's sake, don't Watch me. The demons are now controlling the man's tongue. They're using his voice and they're speaking through different dialects and tones and whatever, and they're talking directly to Jesus. In verse 9, Jesus asks a question What is your name? Jesus asked. And the demon replied, Legion. For there are many of us here within this man. Now, Jesus knows all. He, know, he knew what this man's name was, but he still asked because Jesus will always invite dialogue. He always wants to talk to you. Again, he's relational. Now, Legion is a weird name, isn't it? In those days, it stood for 6,000 soldiers that would make up an army. Whew, that's a lot of demons. Now, it begs the question, were there really 6,000 demons inside of this guy? Or was it the fact that he was filled with so many demons that even Satan himself had lost count? Most Bible scholars believe the latter. That there were just so many in there, even Satan had lost count, and so they just called him Legion, meaning there's just a whole bunch of demons in this man. But Legion, standing for 6,000 demons, whether it was 6,000 or 5,000 or 1,000, just indicates the serious condition that this man was in. Oh, that's a lot of demons. And again, Satan is slowly destroying this man's life. 
He had complete control of him, and he had even robbed him of a name and slapped this label on him. You are legion. Sadly, some of you have begun to accept a label for your lives instead of a name. Oh, she's the divorced one. Oh, he's the man who can't hold down a job. Oh, you know, he's been married four times. Oh, she's the alcoholic. Oh, she's the one who had an abortion. Oh, she's easy. Oh, he's so slow. She's a freak. He's a snob. It's easy to accept a label instead of our name, but I want you to know, you have never been a label to your Heavenly Father. He always calls you by your name. Isaiah 43, 44, 45, you are my special one. You are the one I chose, and I call you by your name. Jesus never called you by a label. He calls you by your name. Maybe a label is what you used to be, but when we come to, to Jesus and we come to know Him, Scripture says we become a brand new creation. We take on His name. We take on His identity. So to Jesus, you are not a label. I love how the message uh, verses this in... Uh, this is the message, Romans 9, 20. I love the, the way this verse is out. Jesus says, I'll call nobodies, and I'll make them somebodies. God doesn't count us. He calls us by name. Arithmetic is not his focus. Don't you love that? Oh, I'm so glad that he calls us by name, and I'm so glad that arithmetic is not his focus. If arithmetic were his focus... <laughs> I don't think I'd make it into heaven. <laughs> Bless my heart, I am terrible at math. <laughs> I really am. I'm convinced there are three types of people in the world. <laughs> three types of people. Those who understand math and those who don't. <laughs> and I don't. I really don't. I'm just going to be vulnerable with you here and just let you know that well, as an adult, I still can't balance my checkbook. I know, it's sad. <laughs> I just, well, whenever I run out of money, I just go to the bank, close the account, go to a new bank, and start all over. <laughs> it just seems a lot easier to me. And it's not that I overspend. I don't do that. Uh, I underdeposit quite often, but I never overspend. I think, uh, I think we realized my problem with math uh, when I was in about the fourth grade, because that's when story problems entered my life. Oh, story problems. Do we really need those? No. Story problems entered my life when I was in the fourth grade, and uh, they always start about the same way, don't they? There was a woman in New York, and she was boarding a train at 10.13 a.m. <laughs> and, of course, I'm thinking, why? Why is she getting on a train? <laughs> Does she not know there is great shopping in New York? She's getting on a train at 10.13 a.m., and she is going to Del Rio, Texas. And I'm thinking, oh, honey, you are not going to find a Nordstrom's in Del Rio, Texas. <laughs> that is three, three miles from the border of Mexico. Don't get on the train. She gets on the train at 10.13 a.m. Now, traveling on the train to Del Rio, Texas, if she's traveling for 98 miles an hour for 38 hours, <laughs> by the time she arrives in Del Rio, how many people are on the train? <laughs> I don't know, and I don't care. And, uh, you know, my family, we never realize, is it a learning disability that I have, or is it just that I'm so bored with math, I don't care to learn it? We don't know, but I do know my dad, very smart man, he would work with me every evening, and we'd do all my math homework. No television for Susie, she has to do math homework. And Then he'd get me up early the next morning, no cartoons for Susie, she has to do more math homework. And so I always passed because my daily grades were great. But when it came time to test, I would sink because dad wasn't there. Well, I'm getting back at my dad now. <laughs> he is 88, and he's trying to learn email. <laughs> yeah, and last weekend, he sent me 500 emails. And they all said the same thing. Did this come through yet? Is it working? <laughs> and I answered all 500. No, not yet. <laughs> I, 
I, I wish I, I knew numbers better, but I'm so glad God is not into arithmetic. Because again, if he were, I'm afraid I just may not make it. God's not into arithmetic. He calls nobodies and he makes them somebodies. Again, you are never a label to your Lord. Now in the next few verses, where I'm going to paraphrase them together, the demons beg Jesus to go away and not to send them to the bottomless pit. You see, they know who Jesus is and they know at the end of the story, by the end of the Bible, they're going to be on the losing team. And so they beg Jesus, don't go away. I mean, go away. Don't send us to the bottomless pit. So this man's words and actions are conflicting. His words are saying, go away. That's the demon speaking through him. But his actions say exactly the opposite. He's running to Jesus and falling face down toward him. So his actions are saying, I need you. But his words are saying, go away. And maybe some of you have faced a similar battle. You know, you, you've given your mind and your life and your heart to Jesus, and he comes into your life and he forgives your sins, but yet that total transformation that we've been talking about the last few weeks still hasn't quite taken place. And so there's a battle going on inside of you. The Apostle Paul talks about this battle in Romans chapter 7, beginning with verse 15. He says, I don't understand myself at all. I decided to live God's way. I decided to place my faith in Him and He forgave my sins, but there's something else going on, my sinful nature, that causes me to do the things I know God doesn't want me to do. In fact, He says it seems to be a fact of life. Whenever I want to do what God wants me to do, I inevitably turn around and I go the opposite direction and I start doing the things that I know He doesn't want me to do. So there's a battle. And then He tells us in the next chapter, Romans chapter 8, whew, thank goodness, I finally found freedom through the power of the Holy Spirit. And that's what we've been talking about in the last few sessions, becoming radically renewed, Romans 12, 1 and 2, by the transforming of our minds, transforming of our minds and the transformation of our hearts, living in the power of the Holy Spirit. Only God can win that kind of battle. You see, the demons were afraid because they knew who Jesus was. And they knew that whenever Jesus shows up, he tends to stir things up. Even Jesus himself said, I've come to stir things up. And so the demons are begging him, please don't get rid of us. Uh, uh, there's a herd of pigs. Throw us into the pigs. Well, humans are Satan's first choice. But if a human isn't available, he'll take an animal. And Jesus cast all the demons into the herd of pigs. And you know the rest of the story. The pigs ran squealing down a hill and into the lake, and they died immediately. Jesus doesn't make deals with Satan, and you can't make deals with Jesus. The next verse, 15, a large crowd soon gathered where Jesus was. But as they saw the man sitting there fully clothed and perfectly sane, they were frightened. No one had been able to calm or help this guy before. Their answer, chain him up. We don't know what to do with him. We don't want to deal with him. But now Jesus has healed him. He's whole. He's dressed. He's sane. He's having an articulate conversation with Jesus, and it's out of the ordinary. Then Jesus got in the boat to leave, and the man wanted to go with him. But listen to what happens in verse 19. Jesus said, no. Go home to your friends, Jesus told him. In other words, your community, your workplace, your family. Go home to your own people and tell them the wonderful thing that God has done for you and how merciful he's been. We tend to think that our greatest mission field is there or way over there or overseas. Many times our greatest mission field is right where we are. It's our family. It's our friends. It's the Children's Center in Bethany, Oklahoma, dealing with little broken lives desperately wanting to be whole. Our mission field is right in front of us, and God will bless us for being missionaries in our own hometown. In other words, Jesus was saying, no, no, come with me. Get out of the graveyard! Guess what? His, his same message is true to us today. He's saying to you and to me, Get out of the graveyard! But some of us have become so comfortable among the dead, we haven't even realized that we're in a graveyard. We've become so comfortable with our sinful, carnal nature that we've overlooked the fact we're living in shackles. And we've become so accustomed to living in shackles 
that we've learned to accessorize them. I can put a little bling on my shackles. I can shine up my shackles, match my shackles to the little bow in my hair and the blue in my blouse, and I can make it all glitter and glitzy and... No. <laughs> we weren't meant to live in shackles. You were meant to live in victory. So Jesus says, get out of the graveyard. Don't live your lives in a small way. Live your lives through the power of the Holy Spirit. And in Galatians 5, 22 and 23, we discover what the fruit of the Spirit is. Patience and peace, joy, kindness, goodness, love, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Get out of the graveyard and live your lives that way through the power of the Holy Spirit and experiencing and manifesting and living in the fruit of the Holy Spirit. Stop settling for far less than what God wants you to be. But Susie, I'm a Christian. I mean, God has forgiven my sins. Good. We celebrate that together. But that doesn't mean that you're living in all that God wants you to have.